Hello there, wherever you may be, and welcome to another service of worship with the United Methodist Church of Palm Springs. I'm Jim Bullock, and I will be your host today, and I welcome you to this time of praising God and learning more about what our relationship with God is all about. And Happy Easter! It's been just a couple of weeks since we celebrated the day that Jesus rose from the tomb. We continue to lift up that event and explore more what it means for our lives, especially for those of us in the second half of life, which means those of us who may be a little on the older side of life or those of us that are on the wiser and more experienced side of life, or both. It's God's way to bring us into the new, transformed life after we experience deaths and dramatic changes of all sorts in this world and beyond. In our worship and preaching at UMCPS right now, we're looking especially at what God seeks to do with the kind of deaths and dramatic changes that happen in life's second half. Today, Reverend Paul Nixon, the UMCPS ministry developer, brings us a message about the transformation in our understanding of faith and especially what Jesus is and what we are wired to discover when we enter into the second half of life. As wonderful as a time as we may have had as children in Sunday school, the learning we received at that time is intended to morph as we age, probably more so than we think or that we've ever been told. Well, at least until now. We look forward to what Paul has to share with us today. And again, we are so glad you were here. Please make yourselves comfortable, and Paul will be with us shortly to start us off with a brief prayer. Friends, we, um, again, we do welcome you. I'm Paul Nixon, ministry developer here. Pastor Jane is away leading a retreat in Wisconsin um, this weekend. We um, pray for her and for that experience. Let's come together in a time of prayer. Um, gracious God, we thank you for gathering us, as always, um, gathering up all the pieces and the experiences of life that have accumulated in us this week and across the years. In this time, as we encounter your scripture, um, help us to ponder the ways that our encounters with you are really different later in life than they were early, and how things that we thought were irrelevant suddenly become powerfully relevant to us. We thank you for your continued and creative work in us across the years. We um, open our minds and our hearts to consider the story of Peter and his disciple friends as they encountered Jesus anew after the resurrection. Our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Today's scripture reading is from John 21, verses 1 through 17. After this, Jesus appeared again to the disciples, this time at the Tiberias Sea, the Sea of Galilee. This is how he did it. Simon Peter, Thomas, named twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the brothers Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter announced, I'm going fishing. The rest of them replied, we're going with you. They went out and got in the boat. They caught nothing that night. When the sun came up, Jesus was standing there on the beach, but they didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to them, good morning. Did you catch anything for breakfast? They answered, no. He said, throw the nets off to the right side of the boat and see what happens. And they did what he said. And all of a sudden there were so many fish in it. They weren't even strong enough to pull it in. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the master. When Simon Peter realized it was the master, he threw on some clothes for he was stripped for work and dove into the sea. 
The other disciples came by boat, for they weren't far from the land, a hundred yards or so, pulling along the net full of fish. And when they got out of the boat, they saw a fire laid with fish and bread cooking on it. Jesus said, bring me the fish you caught. Simon Peter joined them and pulled up the net to shore. A hundred and fifty-three big fish. And even with all those fish, the nets didn't rip. Jesus said, breakfast is ready. Not one of the, of the disciples dared to ask, who are you? They knew it was the master. Jesus then took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had shown himself alive to the disciples since being raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, master, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Then he asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, master, you know I love you. Jesus said, shepherd my sheep. Then he said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was upset that he had asked him a third time. Do you love me? He answered. Master, you know everything there is to know. You've got to know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Have you ever returned to a familiar place only to experience it differently than the way you remembered it? Um, I spent 19 consecutive years away from Southern California after growing up in Riverside County. But in the summer of 2000, my son, who was then I believe 11, and I, we hopped into our little BMW convertible and we drove a road trip all the way from Florida to Santa Monica and back. Um, I have said over the years that Interstate 10 is the main street of my life. We started on 10, we ended on 10. Um, in between, we took Interstate 15, we took 20, we took 40, but it was an amazing odyssey. Along that journey, I took him to a drive-in movie in New Mexico, something I don't know that he's ever experienced even since. We rode the roller coasters in Vegas. Our car battery died on top of Mesa Verde and we had to be towed down to Cortez. In one little gulch of a place, I think it was in Arizona somewhere, there was an old man in this diner who had just ordered one of those singing fish um, that you mount on the wall. If you remember those Billy Bass from like, I don't know, 20 plus years ago. And um, it said on the box, just like on TV, okay? And he, this singing fish tickled him so much that he brought the fish around singing to every table in the restaurant to serenade us. You cannot make this stuff up. Road trips are full of infinite surprises. Our life's journey is just chock full of surprises. But on that particular trip, my biggest surprise was coming back to the city of Riverside, which was my hometown, um, a place I had not seen in 19 years. Um, that place just over the mountains from Palm Springs, in many ways it was the same, in many ways it was different. There were aspects of the neighborhood where I grew up where houses looked exactly the same. The place where we lived had been renovated into a kind of a different look. But it was the one thing that struck me, and I know a lot of us think about that when we go back to places where we grew up and we were smaller, is how small those places seem compared to how big they seemed when we were younger and how much closer various things were to one another. I took my son Jonathan to um, church and familiar faces were still around. Um, the neighbor lady who was a member of our church and, and we swam in her pool um, growing up, um, she invited us over for a Sunday afternoon swim, so my kid got to swim in the pool where I learned how to swim. And her name was Kit. And um, I discovered that she was a little different than the way I remembered her. Um, I'm relating to her now as an adult, and I discovered that Kit had a very dry sense of humor. She was kind of funny. 
And, and this was a new awareness entirely because I never thought of Kit being funny before. But I do remember that my mom loved to hop in the car with her and they would go to lunch and go shopping in Palm Springs and have a blast. And I began to see why my mom liked to hang around with this woman. A familiar place, home, deep feelings of familiarity, and yet nothing and nobody was quite the same as I recalled. Now, some people will conclude you never can go home again because there's too much change. I'm not sure that's entirely true, but I do know this. We can live somewhere for years, for years, and not fully understand all of the dynamics and the narrative that's playing out in that place. And, of course, when we come back after being away for a good while, we see something with fresh eyes. And... We as kids, we just miss stuff. There are people that we meet after having known them maybe back in school. Maybe they were friends. Maybe they were just kind of supporting actors in our life in, the, in that time. And now we see them in fresh ways and we realize, wow, whoa, who knew? Is this the same person from back then? A lot of late life marriages begin this way, with people that we sort of knew a little bit, and then we run into them again decades later. And then there's Jesus. You may have bumped into Jesus along the way. Probably in the United States, the chances are good you bumped into Jesus, or at least somebody's um, spin on Jesus. Your early encounters with him were heavily redacted and choreographed by Sunday school teachers. And quite honestly, when I think back about the Jesus that I knew from that era, a lot of it was a little bit cartoonish. And it didn't really fit with an adult point of view. And then all these years later, whether you settled into church life or you've been more of a a free-range spirit, you run into Jesus again. And now, you're not the same person you were back in vacation Bible school, right? You have history. Um, Life has seasoned you. You have some wisdom. You also have some pain. And probably, if you're maturing at all, you have some acute awareness of your own failings and disappointments. And you meet Jesus again. And it's like meeting him for the very first time because you are not the same person you were back then. Just a few years before that great summer road trip, um, Marcus Borg, um, American theologian, wrote a brilliant book entitled Meeting Jesus Again for the Very First Time, which I think is one of the best titles of any book that I've ever read and honestly one of my top 100 books. Meeting Jesus Again for the very first time. And that's what we're talking about this morning. That we're talking about spiritual encounters that we have that we have with Christ at at a different chapter in our life and it's almost like yeah we know this guy but it's like we feel like we're almost starting over again and we're experiencing this relationship this encounter in such a fresh and different way. This is what happened for the disciples who fled Jerusalem on the weekend after the crucifixion and the resurrection. We read the scripture last week of how Peter and probably John were looking into the um, tomb and they looked around and they saw what was going on and they said, we're going to get accused of being grave robbers here. We need to get the heck out of here. If they weren't already um, really spooked from what had happened on Thursday and Friday, Sunday was the kind of the final straw. They were out of there. They were on the road that afternoon headed back to Galilee, far as they could get from Jerusalem, back fishing. And by late that week, it took about four days to get home, by late that week, they were back on the water on the Sea of Galilee, Lake Tiberias, and wondering if it had all just been a dream. And then the scripture that that Jim read a moment ago, It flows along like this. First of all, there's a deja vu. And in this deja vu, it's a reenactment of an earlier encounter because Jesus is standing essentially in the same spot on the shoreline where he had called these guys three years ago to come and follow him. And now 
They don't recognize him at first, but there he is again, calling from the seashore. It's a reliving of an earlier experience, okay? So you got this deja vu thing. But the second piece is, they're not the same. A lot of water's gone under the bridge. A lot of experiences have happened. This is not the same encounter, nor does it have the same agenda as that earlier encounter. And then there is invitation, there's a miracle, there is a breaking of bread, reminiscent of the loaves and fishes story. They were there for that. Also reminiscent of that um, meal, that cryptic meal on the night before Jesus died that, that we now celebrate and remember as Holy Communion. And then, arguably, the most poignant conversation of Peter's life and one of the best conversations or encounters in all of the Bible, where Jesus asks, Peter, or Simon, he uses his old name, Simon, son of, of, of John, do you love me? And that left some tears in that fisherman's eyes that morning. You see, from the moment that Peter denied knowing Jesus on the night before Jesus died, just before his arrest, Jesus had, Jesus had predicted, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times, meaning before about five o'clock in the morning. No, Lord, I absolutely would not. Never. Absolutely never. And then he got scared. The night turned, um, it turned in a really um, painful direction. And he denied knowing Jesus in that panic moment. And then the rooster crowed. And it was as if in that moment, Peter's spirit also died. In that crucible moment, something in him just died. And it was in that moment that Peter knew that he had burned a bridge. That he had totally screwed it up. Most of us know that feeling. When we said something or did something and we realized, oh no. That is not a, that is an error that is not able to be repaired. We just blew it. His relationship with Jesus, whom he loved, was over. He knew it. He was done. Just like that. Done in all likelihood with organized religion. Done. After that scene, when he looked, took, looked in the tomb and thought the robbers had been here. He was done, 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 back to Galilee. And then a week later, Jesus appears on the seashore and calls him anew by name. And he realizes that, wait a second, I'm not done after all. I cannot read this story without remembering an experience um, on a journey with some friends about 25 years ago when we were it was the autumn, and we were eating an outdoor dinner at the um, YMCA in, I want to say, Capernaum. And it was overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And there was a deck outside the YMCA overlooking the water, and they had dinner service, which is something we don't usually see in the United States at a Y, but they had that there. And it was a pretty good dinner. And, you know, it's dusk, we're looking out across the water, and it's a magical evening, and there's good conversation. And I look down on the, the shoreline, which is probably about three flights of stairs below where we are, and there was a man with a little hibachi grill, the kind that used to cost about nine ninety nine at Walmart, okay, those little hibachis. And, and it was right there in the sand, and he was grilling fish. And, of course, this story comes to mind. And I just, without even announcing where I was going, we'd already ordered our meal. We had a little time. And I just got up, and I just walked down those steps to go see this man grilling this fish. And we had no common language to work with except smiles. But it was holy ground. It was what the Celtics call thin space, where the world and heaven just touch. Now, that's my story. That's not Peter's story. But it's interesting how our stories intersect with all this stuff. And 
Um, I will never forget standing there, watching that man grill his fish, and sensing that I was on holy ground. Each of us has a story of how we've encountered Christ or the Spirit of Christ in various ways over the years of our lives. But specifically, we're thinking today about the latter years, the more recent years. And in these later encounters, the Jesus of the seashore is not asking these guys to come and follow. That was an earlier invitation. This is something deeper now. This is something more tectonic. Jesus addresses Peter by his old name. He addresses him three times. Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? And three times he allows Peter to answer, yes, Lord, you know that I do, as almost offering a ritual of undoing the tragedy of of Peter's three denials of Jesus on that Thursday night, so about ten days or so earlier. After all of that, after all of the tragedy and the, the craziness of that weekend experience in Jerusalem, not only is Jesus alive, which in itself is like, wow, but this resurrected Christ has chased Peter down all the way to Galilee. And for Peter, that may be a bigger piece of news than the resurrection itself. Because what Peter was sure was over, it wasn't over. What he was sure it was done, and it wasn't done. And in that moment, everything changed. Everything changed. I want you to sit with this thought because it's really a pretty powerful idea here. We think we're done sometimes. We think it's over. We think that's the end. We think. We panic. We overthink. And then Easter happens. And we realize we weren't done yet. It happens with relationship to Jesus. It happens with um, people who say, I will never get married again. Okay? Um, Or I'll never go back to school. Or I will never, dot, dot, dot. It's over. Chapter done. And often, it's just not done. (laughs) Because after the years go by, in this case, just a few days, but after time goes by and the water goes under the bridge, we're not the same people we were. And life hits us fresh. You can hunt from cover to cover in the Bible. You will not find a more powerful encounter between two individuals than what happened between Peter and Jesus in this seashore conversation. Peter discovers in a blink of an eye that Jesus is not done with him, and so I guess he isn't done with Jesus. These two characters, one changed by resurrection, one changed by by the persistent love of Jesus and by also his own experience of failure. Sometimes if we don't fail badly enough and fall on our face hard enough, we really aren't awakened to the fullness of our situation. And maybe we aren't awakened to how desperately we need a savior. But Peter knew it. There was no pretending. Has anything like this ever happened to you? I have a sense that it has for many of you. I have a strong sense of that. Some of you have encountered a a fresh experience of Christ in recent years. It may have happened in church. It may have happened out hiking. It may have happened in a relationship with a grandchild. It could have happened serving in the fellowship hall, making and preparing and serving meals to to our friends in Palm Springs. But it's always a surprise. We never see it coming when A little bit later in life, Jesus appears fresh to us. 
About 25 years ago, I planted a new church in a beach community. Um, it was right about the same time that, w- that I took that road trip uh, with my son. He was I- instrumental in helping with a lot of the, the new things we did there. We had a, a good time together, father and son. Um, a beautiful adventure, creating a space for people who didn't do church for the most part, non-traditional kind of experience. But we, after we had had quite a, people, quite a few people come through, we had a new member exploration. And there were two things that everyone in the room had in common. There were about 20 people in the room in a circle. There were two things, and it was just kind of an eye-opener for me in terms of who we, were, who we were connecting with. One is, almost all of them had encountered nuns in grade school, okay, which means they went to Catholic schools, who seemed, to, they all had traumatic experiences with rulers and knuckles, okay? There was something about that, which I thought was kind of, to me it was funny, to them it was not, okay? And then the other thing they said was, they said, we hate church, but we like this place. So they had all had some pretty rough experiences with organized religion, and but universally, all the way around the room, somehow or another they'd had this fresh encounter with Christ that was causing them to engage again and in a very different kind of space. Sometimes on Sundays when I was in that church, I would ask people to just hold up their hand. I would say a year ago, how many of you would have been caught dead in a place like this, um, would not have been caught dead in a place like this in about half the room, okay? Um, I'm not going to ask that right now, but I would say this. If I had rung your doorbell on a Sunday morning five years ago today and discovered you at home and told you that you would be either in a Methodist church house five years hence or watching this on um, YouTube, you might have thought, this guy's nuts. And I know that because I know a lot of the history of, of the folks that are, that are gathering in our church over the last, over the last five years. Um, a lot of us spent some time out and away. The fact is, here we are, and we're not in Sunday school anymore, and this all looks different to us, and it feels different because we have encountered this fresh experience of Jesus with the life history that we brought, and his love was still there. And there was grace and forgiveness there that maybe we didn't even really (laughs) think we needed when we were 15. And we know we need it now. The first words of Jesus when he met these characters on that beach back at the beginning of his ministry were these words, come, follow me. That is a great invitation for a young person full of energy and wanting to change the world for good. But now, years later, the question is, do you love me? (coughs) That is the perfect question for those of us who have some life history. And for which life isn't any more about trying to change the world and tackle everything. Finally, it comes down to um, it comes down to the fact that we want to make peace with life and with God and to discover that that peace is right there in front of us. And it's not a matter of begging, it's a matter of receiving a gift that Jesus so joyfully and graciously offers us. Amen. i
guide you through the night, complete what I've begun. When the evening gently closes in, and you shut your weary eyes, I'll be there as I have always been, with just one more surprise. I was there to hear your burning cry, I'll be there when you are old. I rejoice the day you were baptized, to see your life I'd like to take this time right now to invite you, if you would like to make a gift or a donation to this church, there are three ways you can do that. You can go online uh, and you see the uh, web address down below and make your donation, or you can text your amount of your gift or donation, or you can write a check and drop it in the mail. And either way, uh, whatever you can give, uh, we so appreciate it, and we thank you, and may God bless. Thank you for worshiping with us today, and I hope this encounter that Peter had with Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee has resonated with your life and experience and maybe provoked you to um, need to do some rethinking about your relationship with the, this um, ancient character who is still alive today. Um, would you join me in prayer as we close our service? Gracious God, we thank you for your amazing, resilient love. And we thank you for the way that Jesus embodies that so beautifully. And um, the, the miracle of Easter is amazing, but the miracle of our own Easter is, for each of us, more amazing still. Because not only is Jesus alive, Lord, but you are calling us to life. And for that, we give you thanks. Amen. And we wish you a beautiful and wonderful Easter week. Go and live as Easter people. Go and live with joy and a sense of possibilities that it's not over. It's not over. It's only just begun. <laughs>